My fellow Americans, tonight I am speaking to you because there is a growing humanitarian and security crisis at our southern border. It is crowded and chaotic. Thousands of immigrants from Central America. The migrants charging through police lines. And the humanitarian crisis on our southern border. This is the tragic reality of illegal immigration on our southern border. In 2018, the number of immigrants that requested asylum in the United States of America grew exponentially. Trying to escape from the realities of their native countries, they come to the U.S. seeking asylum. Most of these migrants come from Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, traveling in caravans for protection from the dangers in Mexico. During previous administrations, the asylum policy consisted of granting permission to migrants who qualified for asylum to enter the U.S. and live with an approved sponsor in order to wait for their court date, which in many cases took months to even years to get scheduled for a judge hearing. Leading to the mess caravans, the government took measures to quote-unquote protect the country's security. The measures included the new policy called Migrant Protection Protocols, which would force immigrants who entered the U.S. illegally or without documentation to return to the last country they ingressed from in order to wait for their hearing to request asylum, quote, as a matter of enforcement discretion, end quote. We spoke to Terrence Garrett, an associate professor for political science for the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. He explains how ultimately migrants are being denied entry at the border with this new policy new thing. It used to be people were allowed to cross, or once they crossed into the U.S., they were allowed to uh, go somewhere elsewhere in the country and then have a hearing with an asylum, uh, asylum judge, an uh, um, immigration judge, to ascertain a, whether or not they have a viable claim. What, what's different about this is, is that people are no longer being allowed to do that. They're being stopped in northern Mexico and, and again, only let in very few at a time. That's the difference between now and what occurred previously. George Conchola, a biology professor in UTRGV, tells us more about the danger migrants go through when they use the Rio Grande to cross into the U.S. Uh, disadvantages for using the Rio Grande Valley, uh, the Rio Bravo, or the Rio Grande River, has to do with the dangers that the river has in its currents Many times the migrants enter the river thinking that it's not deep or that they can walk across it and the current just drags them and they end up uh, drowning. Some of these migrants cross over with children on their shoulders or even with a baby in their arms, risking their families and loved ones' lives. They cross illegally just to be detained and returned back to the last country they ingressed from. In a disadvantage, thousands of migrants now rest in temporary containment camps near a bridge that connects the city of Matamoros in Mexico to the city of Brownsville, Texas, waiting for their name to be the next one called. Mark Caswan, Associate Professor of Political Science in UTRGV, further explains the situation. Now what's happening is that the Trump administration is essentially just sending them back to Mexico and, uh, and telling them now you have to wait for your name to be called in order to be able to apply for asylum. Well, the formal name is Migrant Protection Protocols, which is a horribly ironic name because, um, in fact, it's far more dangerous for people to be uh, in the, on the Mexico side. It, it doesn't protect them no. at all. As the migrants wait for their name to be called, thousands are left in campsites in Matamoros. Thousands of miles away from home, they are left to sleep under tents with no access to basic hygienic needs, just waiting for a court date. When addressing the growing humanitarian crisis, the government has resorted to taking the opportunity to fortify walls and increase border security, all in attempts to stop further migrants from seeking refugee, instead of putting their efforts on processing migrants into the U.S. Garrett explains how the migrant crisis has presented the perfect opportunity for the Trump administration to work on their projects. Built a momentum to put in more infrastructure like border walls and, and technology and, and more uh, border patrol. Uh, that's what this is all about. Plus, it uh, appeals to uh, the current president's base. Uh, in fact, that was a big slogan whenever uh, he was running for president, build a wall, build a wall. With thousands affected by the temporary camps, Miguel Gonzalez, a UTRGV student, has a first account testimony on how the government has focused on increasing the security instead of the migrants' welfare. 
It's just like right now there's more security in the middle of the bridge. Like back in 2010, you wouldn't see any of that. I mean, any officers standing in the middle of the bridge. Like you wouldn't see any wire fences. And yeah, it's, the security has increased a lot. The heroes of these crises are the local organizations of the Rio Grande Valley, working together to provide aid and support for migrants living in these saturated and dense camps. These organizations take charge by taking supplies such as food, clothes, medicine, and other supplies to provide the basic treatment these migrants need. Garrett mentioned some of these organizations that come to Matamoros and provide daily to weekly aid. American Civil Liberties Union, the uh, local uh, groups, humanitarian aid groups, uh, Abuela, Tias and Abuelas, angry Tias and Abuelas, uh, the, the, um, all kinds of groups. There's a, now a Team Brownsville with Congressman Vela's support uh, trying to raise money to get temporary structures for, for uh, migrants and, and Matamoros. So there are all kinds of different organizations. Uh, Sister Pimentel's group uh, and, and McAllen, uh, all the way over here into Brownsville. Um, Lupe, all kinds of organizations and uh, groups along the border. The Texas Civil Rights Project. You, you can just go on and on and on with the number of groups that are attempting to, to alleviate some of the misery of, of the migrants uh, trying to come through. And once they get through, to support them after they get here to make sure that they get to where they need to go uh, so they can show up for their um, hearing dates. Caswan further explains in detail about the two major organizations that aid the migrants in their quest to travel to the U.S. for asylum. There are a number of organizations just locally. Um, here in Brownsville, we have two organizations that are um, working very hard to provide support for the asylum seekers that stuck on the southern side of the border. And those are Team Brownsville and the Angry, uh, Angry Abuelas, Angry Tias y Abuelas. Um, and those are really uh, great organizations that are doing some really, some really good work. Many migrants, with the decision to wait for their names to be called in order to apply for the asylum, have decided to stay in camps near the Gateway International Bridge. And in a report from November, the Wall Street Journal states that the number of camp residents very well are more than 3,000 migrants. Living in an area unprepared to be inhabited by such a large number of migrants, the camp is reduced to a way that it cannot satisfy the most rudimentary basic necessities. Without water, electricity, medical attention, or even security, migrants have decided to live there. During the chilly days of winter, migrants only have their tents and jackets to fend of the cold. Many of the students from UTRGV who frequently visit Matamoros cross the same bridge, being first-hand witnesses of the conditions of the camp. Gonzalez tells us what he has seen in the Gateway International Bridge. I've seen a lot of people um, in very poor conditions. Uh, that area was never like a, like a good area, but like now it's even worse because there's a lot of trash. Like it's, uh, you can tell that there's a lot of poverty and that the, the people that are there actually are in extreme need of help. During the hot days of summer, not only are the migrants victims to heat waves, but the heat proves to be a threat, converting the camp into a dangerous breeding ground for diseases. The migrants during heat waves use the river to wash themselves or cool off during the summer. And Dr. Conchola explains what are the health risks of the migrants that constantly use the river. But then there's also the risk of uh, acquiring parasitic infections. There's um, high levels of E. coli, and this can lead to gastrointestinal diseases, diarrhea, vomiting, and then if you add in the heat, all of this can lead to dangerous uh, dehydrations. There's also dead animals that are floating in the river that, you know, carry diseases with them. So the river is definitely not a place that we want the migrant community bathing in or washing utensils or clothing in. The camp has some assigned portable restrooms, but with their limited quantity and such a high number of migrants, it proves impossible for everyone to use those restrooms. From an anonymous student at UTRGV, we get a clear insight on what's happening. Los 
baños, tengo entendido, los únicos baños que usas. The restrooms they are allowed to use are placed by the bridge. Last time I saw was some days ago. The conditions look deteriorated. The people that are in charge of keeping the restrooms clean stop trying. They say their effort is not worth it, as they come back a day after and find the restrooms in worse conditions than before. This caused by the migrants' use or even residents of Matamoros when crossing the bridge. Dr. Controla explains that with poor sanitation, the migrants are susceptible to many diseases. But focusing on those who have a weak immune system, like pregnant women, elderly people, and children, he continues to explain the situation and what is the migrants' reaction to offered medical services on the camp. One of the problems with the refugees is that I've heard they reject medical attention from Mexican uh, services because they uh, either don't trust the doctors or they don't want the medicine that they've been given for free or if they have to purchase their own medicine, they don't have money to buy the medicine. So this is a, a risk for the community. With such poor conditions, migrants have become desperate of living in misery, waiting for their name to be called. During October 10, 2019, migrants protested at the Gateway International Bridge, forcing the Border Patrol to close the bridge, affecting the people that crossed it. The protest was seen as a desperate attempt to cross the border, furthering creating tensions between the migrant camp and the Border Patrol agents. There was many negative feedback from this protest, marking a point in the relationship in which they were seen by the community of Matamoros. One of the workers in a restaurant and shop near the camp shares his points of view regarding the migrants. I'll tell you, the camp is dirty, and it should not be there in the first place. Obviously, I have seen a decrease in my customers of the store. The people do not want to come and see that panorama of misery. Some UTRGV students agree that migrants are causing disturbances, increasing the already existing tensions between the community of Matamoros and Brownsville. One student of UTRGV shares his thoughts. Some of them, some of the population in Matamoros are, are pretty angry because of the immigrants. And, and it's true that they should be angry because it's, a, it's the city of them. and. They have all the right to be angry. Other students have witnessed humanitarian help from the population of Matamoros, providing them necessary supplies for them to live with, while the U.S. government focuses on reinforcing security. The Department of Immigration has focused their efforts on reinforcing security, but I have seen some residents of the city of Matamoros still supplying the immigrants with help, such as medicine, clothes, food, and even trying to set up shelters outside the bridge for them. The migrants are becoming victims of mistreatment and now are subject to a negative relationship with the native people of Matamoros. There are no right or wrong answers for this crisis. The only fact is that people are suffering in these conditions, while the U.S. government remains silent. The crisis has proven a significant point. Many of the immigration policies established more than 30 years ago do not keep up with the new migratory needs. As climate change continues to change the landscape, and with an ever-increasing instability around the world, it is reasonable to expect a larger and more frequent migratory waves. The caravan may just mark the new beginning of an era, and the amount of aid we are willing to provide will determine the portrait of us for future generations. For now, one thing is clear. If the U.S. does not update their migration policies, we are to expect a far worse humanitarian crisis.